We're going to see if there's anything good here. We're going to do it real quick because it's kind of late and it looks a little ghetto, but you know, <laughs> sometimes you find good stuff and you just never know. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey everybody, it's George the Antique Nomad, and I am here in Centralia Square. This is where I had my first office when I was working in the antique business. And then when I left uh, to do this as a solo dealer, I took a space here and you can see part of it behind me. I've been away because of the pandemic, so I'm so glad to be back. And I've put a few new things out, including that lovely pheasant behind us today. And I am here with a very special guest who I'm going to show you now. Actually, three very special guests. You will recognize if you watch YouTube. This is Stephanie from Thrifting Adventures and her sons Mateo and Brando. And I am so glad to have them here. And we are going to run around Centralia and we're going to do some thrifting. We might look at a museum. We're here in the antique store. So we're just going to have some fun today. It is so cool to meet up with other YouTubers. So Stephanie said she recently sold some of these ornaments in one of her live sales. And there are a lot of variations on this. The ones who started this, their stuff is really valuable. Most of these sell for, you know, six or eight or ten dollars each, but some of the ones by that first company can go for hundreds of dollars. So don't just look at these and think that they're junk. They are, there are some really good ones out there. Here's a really beautiful blue Weiss pin with the inverted stone. See how the point is at the top instead of the bottom? That was a thing in the 60s to give jewelry a different look, and it really does, and people are very partial to it. And for a signed pin with that deep color and those stones to be $26 is a good deal. Oh, cool. So the guys found an old scale. Isn't that a neat one? I like that big brass pan. That looks like it's going to be from about 1890, and this would have been in a store to weigh all sorts of things. Brando and I were just talking about how these old scales worked, and... Here's how they work. This one's pretty beaten up, so it might have been from a hardware store. But each one of these is a different slide. And this one here is for ounces, this one's for pounds, and then that's going to be 10 pound increments there. Then if you had a lot of weight, like a bunch of nails or screws, then what you would do is you would hang extra weights on here to make it even heavier. And then whatever you put in the pan would raise it and then you would know exactly how much the weight was and that's how you did it in the old days oh, show them what you like archie okay Mateo, are you gonna get one no what got you into archie um well um uh, our mom talks about <laughs> Oh, your mom talks about it. Yeah, because Archie's kind of from when we were kids. He's a clown decanter and he would have had shot glasses hanging off of him. And I love to take pictures of creepy clowns because um, <laughs> Misty at Thrifter Junker Vintage Hunter loves clowns. And she hates it when I say that because she really <laughs> hates them. Stephanie's a gnome collector and she spotted these. These are Goebel Cowboys and these were done in the 1970s and they were all various occupations or sports and they all had names. You can see that one is Gil. Let's see if we can get in on that. Or Gilles, who is the hockey goalie. You've got a fireman with a hose. You've got a deep sea diver named Gerd. You've got the guy in the life preserver and you've got a blacksmith named Ben. They're very cute and not everybody who knows Hummels knows that these exist, but they are actually rather collectible and the prices range anywhere from about $35 on up. There are some rarities that are quite a bit more. This dealer has a whole bunch of Shelly cups and saucers. And Shelly was a company in England that made really good quality porcelain and they went out of business in 1966, which was a lot earlier than a lot of the English companies that quit production. And because of that, there's a yeah. bigger collector market for these than there are for other cups and saucers. Uh, they also did entire dinnerware sets, coffee pots. There are some real rarities in Shelly. I have friends who are dealers out of California who specialize in it. They were involved with the writing of the book on Shelley, and they really know their stuff. 
their biggest known pattern is see the blank here meaning if you took the roses off and it was just the blank that's called dainty and there's dainty blue there's dainty with roses the shape of the cups is like this so where an average english cup and saucer might sell for eight or ten dollars these days a lot of the shelly pattern cups and saucers sell for 35 and more we are leaving Centralia Square Antique Mall. We found an Archie comic book and the guys are standing there and we were just down in the basement, but it's conveniently located because right next door, hey, across the street, is one of the better thrift stores in the area okay. called Visiting Nurses. And so we're gonna walk right over there and see what that's like. So of course, when you walk into a thrift store, the first thing you do is figure out, are they having any special sales? We've got orange tags on clothes, half off, hats, gloves, and scarves, Halloween. Ooh, Halloween, we'll see if they have any old Halloween. You can see that they're already getting ready for Christmas here, so that's why the Halloween is on sale. So the first thing I see when we come in is this really nice vanity and chest of drawers. And these are waterfall. And this is really waterfall from the 1930s. The reason they call it waterfall, ooh, and that one even has a little mirror. Look how it starts out and then it breaks a little bit in the front. It keeps curving down like a waterfall falling down the mountain. And this one's got a really neat design to it. Now, a lot of these designs in the 1930s, because they were saving money, they may be veneer, they may even be printed paper in this case. So you wanna be careful when you clean these that you don't scrub them hard because you could scrub the design right out of it. And I've gotta say, these are really thrift store priced. This is only $79.99. Now you would have to replace the glass. You probably wanna replace the glass on both sides to match. But then the other piece is only $99.99 and it even has a mirror, which is unusual on these. So really great deal. What a good look for the price. Then behind here, we've got an old stoneware lamp from the 70s. And then when I look down here, here's two pendant lights. And these are only $9.99 for the pair, and these sell pretty well for me, so I think I'm going to buy them. $2 for the Homeco? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they really, the prices are good in this place. It really is a place you can shop, so I wanted to bring you here because, uh, you I know. I like these prices a little better. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Stephanie's channel is all about saving money through thrifting and making money through thrifting. That's her motto. and. So she's really smart about going in and really being careful about prices. And that's actually how you, you know, honestly, any dealer or reseller will tell you, you make your money when you buy it, even more than when you sell it. And I showed these to Stephanie and she agreed. She said these would sell really quickly in Portland and I think they would sell really quickly in Seattle. So I'm gonna take them. So there's a nice trunk under here too, a slat trunk. And it's priced at $49.99, not a bad price. Uh, the leather often is gone on these. You can replace them. But what's nice about this one is the top is flat. A lot of people like to use them. They either stack them or they'll sometimes put a piece of glass on them and use them as an end table or a coffee table. And so you really like the flat ones these days better than the dome top ones. The dome tops look cool, but you can't use them in as many places. And they got a lot of bottles here. This actually seems to be their little antique area. This juicer is cool. It's Hamilton Beach. And it's got the neat stand in the green, kind of like the old milkshake makers. It's so crazy that this thrift store is right by this antique mall. They get a lot of dealers who come over and go shopping because it's right here. This little shell lamp would probably sell in Florida but I'm getting quite a pile of stuff to take to the Florida show, so I think I might leave that for now. Chinese lacquer boxes, some precious moments, kind of your usual thrift store stuff. This guy is really cute, but he should have a lid, so he's 1930s Japanese lusterware, though. And then I always think of Barb at Winking Owl Antiques, who is with Jeffrey on Real Nifty Vintage in their live sales because she does the restaurant wear. And this is Desert Wear by Wallace China. So very well made. 
And I need to show these lamps here. I walked by them and then I looked again and I realized these are actually from about 1980. And these are part of that glassware line that was sold at home, at home parties around then, which has become pretty collectible now. And I'll put the name in the ticker. It's a common name that is absolutely escaping me right now, but those are priced at $29.99 each. And actually, for people who collect this, that's a very inexpensive price. Here's a piece of treasure craft. They started this line in the United States and then they shifted over to Mexico. And if you look, the painting isn't quite as good. It's not really within the lines on the glaze. It's a little sloppier. They only produced in Mexico a brief while. They had quality control problems there, so then they shifted the production to China and then it went away entirely. That's why I primarily only collect the American made personally. But they did do some neat stuff that was after that. And of course, all of it is out of production and has collectible factor now. And then right across the aisle, here's one that was made in America little different pattern, but the sombrero chip and dip was a very popular thing because it was a one piece. And this says treasure craft pottery craft made in USA. This is when they first came out with the sombrero in the mid 80s. And you'll see that it's stoneware rather than the ceramic that was on the bottom. That's why you see brown rather than white. Stoneware is fired at a higher temperature, so it's better quality. People enjoy these. They're kind of large is the thing. Large was big in 1980s and 90s stuff. And now people, some people like big and some people want smaller things if they're doing more apartment living. So we'll see if there's a customer for this. Now I'm starting to look for this style of pottery. This is 80s Neo Deco Revival. But I was at the Epic Antique Mall in Seattle and watched someone spend a bunch of money and it was a young couple in their 30s. This one's only priced at $2.99, but I have to be honest, I'm looking for the signed pieces. Treasure Craft did a line of this, and some other companies did as well. But this is starting to be a look, particularly if you find white or some of the colors that are trending currently. Here's something that Fat Birds could do on their flipping and sipping called Loaded Questions, because they do ask some loaded questions on that show. So Stephanie found some stuff, these Dayglow stickers, if you remember when Neon was in in the late 80s and early 90s, and they're flamingos, so that's pretty cool. They are all dressed up for winter. They must be up here. And then he is cute. He's got to be from the 70s, I would say, and hand-painted. And Christmas is coming, and you just did a Christmas special, didn't you? Not too long ago. And then oh, there's yeah, Homco Mouse with the lid. Cute. Boy, 99 cents, can't beat that. We've got a couple of blow molds here, but these look newer than what I do. There's a Sears nativity set made in Italy. That's interesting. I wonder if maybe one of the good Italian wood carving companies did this, like Henri or one of those, because actually the detail looks pretty good. And this was $75 new. It's so strange, I hadn't even looked down here. But now I'm thinking this might be something I need to check out. So we'll do that in a minute. But the reason I came over here was Spode Christmas tree. Definitely a pattern that still sells and comes out this time of year. And Spode is great quality, but this is glass where they had made to go along with it. And it's a set of four double old fashions because we all know that for some folks, the holidays bring out the need for a double old fashioned. Well, here's the nativity set. It's all kept nicely in a bag. It looks like it's in good shape, and it does look like it's good quality, but it's also $60, so I think it's probably more than I could buy for resale. So a lot of the older stuff is segregated still, and that's convenient for us who look for vintage and antique. This is a cute cottageware teapot from Japan for the lid, but the base is actually Shawnee. So that one's a marriage. One single Fostoria American candlestick for $6. That's pretty good. And then we've got this nut dish. This is also antique. Well, almost antique. It's Noritake. The M stands for Moramura Brothers. 
made in Japan, so that's 1930s. These hand painted with the nuts, well, they were nut dishes, obviously. And $9 isn't a bad price. There's a really fun pair of bottle art pieces. This was very popular to do in the 1970s where you would take a bottle and you could buy kits, you could cut them apart, you could melt them and stretch them. This would have been a little beer bottle that they have turned into these very silly and fun figures. They're five dollars each. I think somebody would think they were really cute and a lot of fun. And you know they are folk art. It's just folk art of the mid-20th century. Here's a bunch of Metlock's IV cup and saucers, only two dollars each. That really is a bargain and there is money in that if you wanted to bother with the shipping. But I have a lot of Metlock's dinnerware that I haven't been able to put out for a consigner, so I don't really have any business buying any more. And here's an old, we're in logging country, so you're gonna see these. This is original from the 60s or 70s. It has split with age. You could fill that in, but for $70, I'm gonna let that be someone else's project, even though I like the little modernist legs on it. And here's a place that we probably will be going later. These are old fruit labels, actually, and these are from Florida. They always make more fruit labels every year. They did back in the old days when they used these than they thought they would need because they never knew how big the crop was going to be. So you end up with lots of extras and people like to frame them. There's some great graphics. Look at this big city. Look at the big city from probably 1950 when cities looked like that. Pretty cool. So while Stephanie is checking out, she got some pretty cute jewelry and things. I'm going to look at this case that I haven't looked at and I see a couple things that are interesting. I don't know what high school this is or what town, but this is a souvenir cup made out of spelter, which means it could have lead in it. Those were not a great thing to drink out of, but it's a souvenir from about 1910 from some town. And I think I've been asked to see it because down below at two shelves, I see a Sasha Brastoff little vase with the figure that looks rather like a totemic figure, so that may be part of his Alaskan line that was actually done by Adams, but signed with Brastoff's name on it, and then Adams broke off and did his own. And I also see this feather hat. Now it's $13, but feather hats in good condition sell well, and I might spring for that, especially because there's a 15% off discount today. And then there's also this Treasure Craft footprint handy tray and you know I used to see these all the time and I don't anymore so I think I need that. Interesting that I found treasure craft here when I was involved with the outlet center here they had the Falls Craft store. Falls Craft owned treasure craft and then discontinued treasure craft while I was working here which is what got me interested and eventually led me to write the book on treasure craft. Well between Stephanie and I we have been popping she's checking out and I'm waiting to look in the case so while I wait I just wanted to say thank you for viewing and also to remind you, if you'll click that subscribe button, that really helps us. It doesn't cost you anything, but it lets YouTube know that you like what we're doing. If you want to take a membership, you can actually hit the join button or look at the video in my playlist to find out more about that. I want to thank my members for helping create additional content as well. And now back to our video. Well, I'm not wearing that feather hat, but how do I look in these steer horns? Like the rhinestones. Rhinestone steer horn hat. That would be pretty awesome, except I don't think I could hold it up on my head. So behind me is the old train depot in Chehalis. This is the neighboring town to Centralia, and this is now the Lewis County Historical Museum. And one great thing about being an antique nomad is you get to go around and look at interesting old things everywhere you go. I used to know the director of this place. Museums are an interesting place to find merchandise as a reseller, believe it or not. If you have a local museum, you might quietly ask them if there's things that they're trying to deaccession because unfortunately, a lot of folks donate their stuff to the museum thinking it's all going to be on display, but like this museum at one time had 75 treadle sewing machines. Everybody in town had donated their treadle sewing machine and they just couldn't do anything with that many. 
And we got to have a picture of the guy smiling in front of the museum because this is something for them to have some fun today. Um, really kind of not just little puppets like this, but really intricate puppets, like mm -hmm. animals that have a lot of details and stuff. And you can buy them sometimes for like over $100 and stuff. Wow. Folk Mattis, okay. Interesting, yeah, so, so Stephanie is educating me about this. I did not know, these have been made since 1976, and the company is Folk Mattis. And older ones, apparently, some of them are very collectible. So that is really cool. Yeah, ones that they don't make anymore and stuff. Um, Especially like the more intricate animal ones and stuff, the bigger ones that bigger and more elaborate are like quite collectible. That is really awesome. Good information. You know, Chehalis and Centralia and this area on the surface look like, you know, nice typical American small towns, but in reality, some really interesting history has taken place in this area. The first thing we see here was purchased in 1881 by Stickland Funeral Home, which is still the local funeral home. And this was a carriage made in Columbus, Ohio in the 1880s. This would have been along with a horse-drawn hearse, it says. Then you've got a bunch of railroad lanterns because this is a railroad area. Centralia had five railway lines that crossed at one point. The Union Pacific, the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific, the Great Northern, the other ones were the Northern Pacific, and the fifth one is eluding me, but I'll put it in the ticket. Wow, this is really neat. Yes, so this was done by a local fellow named Bob Anton. The, the guide was just telling me, along with the local tribes here, to be as faithful a recreation of a long canoe that would have been used on Puget Sound back before white settlement. The thing I've always liked about this museum is when you walk in, they have these vignettes, which are really great to show how things were done in the old days. So this one is a barber shop. You've got the little sterilizer cabinet. You have people's shaving mugs because people left their shaving mugs at the barber. They didn't take them home with them. You had your own mug and your own brush and they left it there. And when you came in every day, you got your shave and that was how that worked. And you've got the old barber chairs. I like the old Oster quality clock there. And then here's a bunch of straight razors, the old kind that they used to use. A lot of times if you were in a profession, your shaving mug would have your profession written on it. So for example, you have teacher there. There'd have been one for the fireman that would have had a fire horse and carriage. Some of them were just floral, but usually they actually talked about what you did in town. And then the old barber bottles, and these are old ones. You can see the original porcelain caps. These are not reproductions. And they have witch hazel and bay rum and all those old tonics that they used to put on you when they did your tonsorials. And then this next vignette is to show what kitchens looked like between 1900 and 1920 and how they changed. So you have the primitive cupboard, the pie safe with the tin sides, and the old ice box because you didn't have refrigeration unless you got a block of ice and put it in that. You have an old kitchen queen so that you can sift your flour, do all your meal prep, have storage, have under cabinets, and you see all the old kettles and spice tins. You would have had an old wood stove like this majestic here. In this part of the country it would have been wood, in other parts of the country it might have been coal or possibly gas. But then in the 1920s electric stoves come along and look how streamlined and modern this is compared to that old wood stove. And then because this was the old railway station, of course they have the old stuff from the railroad here, including, if you turn to the right here, this is the original ticketing window still here. You can see a video playing with Mount St. Helens erupting. Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 really devastated this area. The blast went to the north and cleaned out something like a billion board feet of lumber and since lumbering was the occupation that employed most people here, there was suddenly terrible unemployment and the average income fell to less than that in the state of Mississippi. And that's why downtown Centralia was vacant and that made room for all the antique stores to move in. Here is 
a display of volcanic ash fall. People kept it. I know when I first moved here, 10 years after this happened, I had to have the gutters cleaned and there was ash so big that it was clogging everything up. However, people are pretty inventive and they find their way out of problems. So behind there you see the picture of the eruption and in front you see ceramic pieces made of Mount St. Helens ash that were developed by artists in this area. They also started using it in glass blowing. Speaking of things from this area, a lot of the items in this room are from the original inhabitants of this area. The descendants have a reservation near here called the Chehalis tribe, and the Chehalis are known especially now for basketry, and that is because of the woman who made this twined basket here, Mary Kiowa, and she was Cowlitz, but she really inspired the tribes of this area. This is all in the realm of Salish basketry, but she really got interested in preserving the art and it has really, uh, you see another basket on the left by her, it has really helped uh, preserve this tradition and become something that actually sells very well to tourists. The newer pieces are very popular. There she is with her grandchildren. She was involved with a lot of different uh, tribal activity as well as trading with other tribes, which was commonplace throughout the Northwest United States. So you see, for example, the gloves with the gauntlet there, those are probably crow. A lot of the beaded work would have been traded for and wasn't done by the coastal Indians. She lived until about 1970 and really did help keep the tribe and its traditions alive. There you see Skookum dolls, which were popular in the 1920s originally because of the Apple Commission in Yakima, which is the other side of the mountains from here, developing that as a trademark. You see some just really beautiful basketry, older and newer pieces alike. And speaking of newer pieces, it doesn't look new, but this is another canoe done in the traditional styles. This would have been a smaller canoe for river travel and this one they used old wood so it has the splits and the aging of old but this is actually a faithful recreation including the paint on it which not all bands of tribes did but the Chehalis did do the traditional painting. Here's a neat bark basket. Cedar bark is another thing that's used Baskets are made in several different ways, and this is a good indication right here for you, so you can freeze frame this if you want to learn more about the different ways baskets are made and decorated. And in the Salish tribes, imbrication is a particularly interesting thing. It is the way they decorate the surface of a coiled basket using some other flat material. It could be a different color of grass. If you're farther up towards Alaska, it could even be sealed gut. Here's a nice example of a twined basket. And then you'll see more beadwork, uh, really beautiful beadwork. Again, most of this would have been traded from the plains. You see the one that is parflesh, which means skin. And then this is a Klamath basket. The trade in the Northwest tribes went well down to close to the Oregon-California border particularly because the obsidian fields were near Bend, Oregon. And obsidian was a very important thing in trade because it made very good sharp arrows. And then this is a Salish tribe, such as the Chehalis. So while I'm thinking of it, please comment in the space below here and also hit the thumbs up button to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button below. Also, hit the bell below to be notified of new videos coming every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for following along. Let's go back to this video. Now, these are examples of some of the fragments that bottle diggers and metal detectors... Ooh, there goes the train. 
which is appropriate because I was just about to mention Crazy Lamp Lady and she always has to stop for the train in her videos. She started out as a relic recoverist, that's her channel on YouTube regarding her prospecting as a bottle digger and metal detector. She and Drew both got started doing that and that's how they met. And these are the type of things that you find and these are all remnants of an excavation here in this area, but this is pretty typical of what you see all over the place. Medicine bottles, things that people just tossed when they were done. This place is called the Chuck Wagon and it is full of all sorts of things people would have just used around the house that were taken for granted. There's these big long rifles there. You've got your usual kitchen goods. You've got the little wooden butter churn there, number four. There's someone's high button shoes. Pile of crutches. Look at that neat wicker carriage and there is a picture of the original inhabitant. I say carriage, but it actually was probably carried on someone's back, believe it or not. Old oak barrel. And then you've got the old store display stuff here on the right. The cotton spool display, the coffee grinder, and of course the old cash register. Now this is set up as a blacksmith shop and people had to have everything hand forged at one point because you couldn't just go buy metal stuff at the hardware store. They didn't have Home Depot back then. So the blacksmith had to make everything for you. They had to make your horseshoes. They had to make your tongs. This one has all of the implements you would have used in a blacksmith shop, hammers and hacksaws, and this really great big anvil. Anvils are very collectible now. In fact, all of this stuff really is. The forge in the back there with the big bellows, those are a few thousand dollars if you can find them. And this one was from the first harness shop in this area in the 1860s. And then here are the anvil. This anvil is probably worth four to five hundred now. People really like these things and collect them because there are people using them again, but also because people, I think, really long for a day where they felt like they were a little closer to the production of things and things just didn't all come out of a box and off of a ship. Because we're in logging country, you're going to see all sorts of things. This funny contraption that looks like a bicycle is actually something that would have been used for grinding and polishing. You can see the strap on there that they would have used for that purpose. And then you've got the old crosscut saws. You've got the saw handles. You have a wide variety of different filing devices because saws had to be filed before there were chainsaws to keep them sharp. This is quite a variety of logging industry things. Logging was a very dangerous occupation back then. The trees were huge. You were cutting things down manually. You didn't have a lot of electric equipment. It was a messy job. It was a dirty job. It was fairly low paying and it was very difficult. Look, it shows a picture of all the people in iron lungs. Wow. Back when, like polio was hard oh, to Oh, I, my grandfather had a case of it when he was a kid and yeah. actually my, um, my mom, when she was born, because he had had it, they gave her some of the vaccine in the trial and they gave her the live vaccine and she got a small case of it. Oh, wow. So it ran in my family, but I didn't realize that some of them had to be um, put in an iron lung as a result. That's crazy. This cost $1,600 in 1941. That was more than most people made in a year. First patient to use the lung was a 15-year-old polio victim in 1946. Wow, and that kept them breathing when they couldn't do that themselves, kind of like the ventilators now. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. And Centralia Hospital had this, which means that my grandmother, who worked in Centralia Hospital, probably saw this thing when it came in. That's really interesting to me. Wow. <laughs> this thing is cool. Look at all the old advertisements. This is a theater oh. curtain, and this would have been something that would have been put in front of the stage to advertise everything before the show started. 
and it's got all sorts of old businesses from the area painted on it. These are pretty collectible. If you see one of these, you know, it can cost a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, especially if it has local interests like this. So that's a pretty neat thing to see here. And one other thing that you might not recognize, sometimes they have railroad marks on them and sometimes they don't, but you will sometimes find in somebody's old shed where they managed to get one of these when the railroads got rid of them, but this is the original metal step that they used to get you up into the trains. And these are worth a few hundred dollars each. So one of the cool things about going to a museum is you get to see all sorts of stuff displayed in a way that lets you know what it is so that when you see it out in the wild, you can recognize it and see if it has value. And then I wanted to show these. The, on the right is a totem pole that was carved by a scout troop around 1950 and painted. On the left is a cigar store Indian. Now this one dates to the 1950s, but the cigar store Indian was an American icon, became very popular around the 1890s or 1900 initially to have a carved Native American chieftain and even if they were not an accurate representation of the people who lived in your area, this was the style. So this is what they typically looked like. And this was so that you could identify a tobacco store when you were driving down the street without having to stop and figure out where you could get it. Imagine if every vape shop had something like this in front of it now. I don't think you could get away with that these days. But they're really neat. They're very collectible. This one dates to about 1950 and was made in Oregon for a Chehalis cigar store. And these are worth a few thousand dollars now. Speaking of lumber, since this is an election year, you hear a lot about stump speeches. And stump speeches literally were because of places like this. This is a piece of the McKinley stump. This was for when President McKinley was going to make a tour of the West Coast in 1901. And they would, in the logging towns, they'd take where they had felled a tree and they'd cut it down. And the president, in this case, it's Roosevelt, and he's in a gazebo, but a lot of times they would actually stand on a stump and they'd give their speech because it stood above the crowd. Well, McKinley never got the chance because he was assassinated. Yardbirds is a gigantic 100,000 square foot facility that was an amazing department store, variety store, thrift store, everything you could imagine store. They were all under one roof. You could buy everything from a car and a trailer to groceries at this place at one time. And the original founder had this really cool Yardbird, which is an old crow built. They just restored this a little while ago and if you see the back end opens up they actually made it as a storage unit. Uh, originally there was a taller one that stood high and he could park his helicopter in there. Unfortunately the one that was the big tall one burned down at one point when this was still a thriving local department store so they replaced it with the one that you see here. And now it is a giant flea market slash emporium of whatever. And here's our crow's feet. It started in the 1940s as an army surplus store. Stephanie and I are at the old Yardbirds and we are at the remainder of today's flea market. We're going to see if there's anything good here. We're going to do it real quick because it's kind of late and it looks a little ghetto, but you know, sometimes you find good stuff and you just never know. So we're going to give it a shot. So there's a green Italian chalice and these owl salt and pepper shakers and those are both cute. The owls have an ear broken though, darn it and an ironwood fish, also with a broken thing. You know, at the end of the day at a flea market, you may not get the best stuff, but that table's kind of nice. That's older. These David Winter cottages used to be pretty collectible. I think some people are still interested in them. They were done in the early 80s in Great Britain. And look how much it was new, $88 and $15 at a flea market. So there might be room in those. Aw, <laughs> look how cute that is. Oh, oh, he looks wow. very happy to be alive. That's got to be from the 30s or 40s. Wow. 
And then over here, Stephanie pointed out a piece of Desco ware. This is similar to Le Creuset, made in Belgium. It's good quality, it's heavy, and this one doesn't have any chips on the enameling. So it's got some staining that looks like it'll come out. It's not scratched. I think I'm going to ask about this. The other pieces are missing their handles, so they're a no-go. Oh, wow. What is this from? That's really cute. I'd say probably the 50s. Yeah, 56. 56, yeah. Yeah, those, those are very pretty. Telegrams are usually really boring, but um, those are actually very cute. Oh, and they look like they're English. I saw a stamp on the back that said something Shire, Warwickshire, rugby, huh, where the yeah. rugby game was invented. That's cool. Oh yes. Fun. Yep. Bank. Yeah, they had a man and a woman in the rocking yeah. chairs together, and I haven't had one of those for a while. Little honey bear with the pot, but he's missing some of his paint, and I'm real picky about condition. Oh, these were popular in the 80s. Oh, I remember these people really having nice. them all over the place. That's right. This one is quite old. This one is going to be from about the 19 teens or 20s, and the green and yellow are actually good colors, but he's pretty chipped up. He's only 99 cents though, but he's just not in good enough shape for me to pick up. Oh, this is pretty. And then this one says USA. This is going to be 1960s with the drip glaze. Pig banks are called that because pig, P-Y-G-G, -G, is a type of clay that was used to make banks originally, and that somehow got distorted into pig, P-I-G, and that became the reason that they started making piggy banks. Here's something I cannot imagine anyone having nostalgia for. This little bell was made in New Orleans, me remembering Katrina, 2006. I think most people would like to forget Hurricane Katrina. So this is a good kitty or a bad kitty? Stephanie and I both looked at this and we both like, oh, it's Linux, it's good quality, it's only 99 cents. They came out in the early 90s, but they just don't go for a lot. So we're both trying to convince ourselves that one of us should get it. Okay, we decided it was a bad kitty because we looked closer and the ears are chipped. Sometimes when you're not sure about something, it's terrible to say this as a reseller, but sometimes you're just like, I hope it's damaged and then I have an excuse not to get it. <laughs> so poor kitty needs an ear transplant. I guess it got chewed. Well, we are at Dibbles and I just love that name. And Dibbles has antiques and vintage and furniture. And there was one time I walked in here and they had a Rosewood sideboard for $200, which I bought and sold to a Seattle dealer friend of mine the next day for $400. And he then sold it the next day for $800 and gave me a little bit more, which was nice. So I always check this place out. So we walk in and we see a bunch of old kitchen stuff with the wood handles from the 30s and 40s. And people definitely like to collect that. I have to admit, I like this scale. I think it's a scale, house proud. Yeah, and you weigh the stuff right in the cup. And then this must be, there you go, to adjust it. Looks like something right out of the 50s. And it says made in USA registered design, so they didn't want anyone to steal that. I like any 50s era plastic kitchenware. And I like scales. I have a thing about scales lately. And a bunch of Franciscan Desert Rose. The microwave bowls were not made for a very long period of time. They only made those briefly in the late 70s. $40 is probably about the right price nowadays. Those used to go for a hundred plus because when they moved the production to England in the late 1970s, they quit making those pieces and they'd only been in the line a few years and a lot of people didn't get them when they were available, so they were very popular on the aftermarket, and they're still one of the more expensive items. 
Those are cute little 1930s Japanese pieces, and they would have been, you see the one has the diamond in it, um, they would have been to put on the table during bridge games, and usually they'd have a little handful of nuts, or oh, okay. you could use them as salt dips, or sometimes if they have an indentation, they're actually little ashtrays from back when people had unfiltered cigarettes that were really short. The one I like is the little seahorse, just because I'm getting ready for Florida, and it's just a little 50s thing. But he's bone china and he's nicely painted and people like seahorses so i think we'll take him up to the counter and then behind here is all this it's a variant on geisha girl geisha girl is 1930s wear but this is where it has the brown in it and these canteen shaped objects are a little different these flasks and then the woman with the parrot is a wall pocket and I got all excited about her until Stephanie pointed out that her neck was broken and re-glued, which is something you really have to watch for. So she saved me from spending money on something that was broken. Hopefully I can show you this without getting demonetized. These were very popular in the 40s and 50s. They are decals and they're always on very plain glass. On one side they have a lovely lady and on the other side they have the lovely lady without her dress. And we're just going to leave it at that because I like YouTube to like me and I don't want to offend any viewers but she's pretty cute. And then these guys here I think are very cute because they're chefs and chefs tend to sell well and they have corks in them so we know they're older. And this one's for salt. I wish there was one for sugar, but these were for the range. And so it's not going to necessarily be a salt and pepper. We have salt and flour. It looks to me, looking at the bottom, that they have a mold mark, but not a factory name. They look like California pottery. They could have been one of the many, many, many small studios making California pottery then. And then we have a bunch of prayer ladies, and these were very popular in the 1960s, made in Japan. And you can see the prayers are printed on their aprons. It's generally the kitchen prayer, the dinner prayer. This one is spoon storage, and I pray I don't drop her. They're collectible because they have a real sweetness about them. And I'm going to take these up and see what they want because I don't see a tag. And more stuff that can get you in trouble with YouTube. Fortunately, they're facing away. These were based on the Dorothy Kendall lady mugs of the 1940s, but these are going to be Japanese from the 50s. And they similarly are ladies in states of undress as the handles. This place certainly has vast amounts of little figurines of all sorts. They said they just got back from some sort of a buy, and I can see that they are very loaded down with stuff. There's an old mixer, but that's a pretty full price there. And the Wagner stock pot. That probably is about what that one goes for with the loop handle. The loop handles are often missing on those. The old batter bowl, but that's the milk glass. Those do not sell as well as the ones in color. This has sort of a modernist shape with the grapes, but it seems to be a home ceramicist job and not something that I think I have a customer for. And then blue geese. Yes, blue geese. They are going to be back in style soon. It's been 35 years and this particular one is marked upside down where I can't quite read it, but produced in USA by Wire pottery. Here's some plastic fantastic red kitchenware, and this is going to run the gamut of ages. These little egg holders here, I believe, are an Italian design from the 1970s. This pepper shaker, on the other hand, is from the 50s and says California Boulders Incorporated Los Angeles. The little tomato is something that sells as a kitchen timer, but that one does not feel like it works. 
And then this one's newer because it's got a recycling mark on it for number four. But this teapot napkin holder is old from the 40s and 50s. If you get the 40s and 50s stuff from the USA, there is a customer for that. And we're in the Northwest, so we see these pieces, this totem ware. Some of this is Japanese, but some was made by Orcas Island pottery. Orcas Island is an island up in the San Juans, right in floating in the ocean between Washington and Canada. The red bowls look like something that someone made in Japan in the 1960s. Now here's something that you don't see too often anymore, but this is something to look for. This is Dorothy Thorpe, the silver fade glasses that are popular with people now and that a lot of resellers know. Well, this woman is the one who did those and this is the same thing. They do tend to get worn. This one's probably a little more worn than I would like, especially there where the scratches are. But this textured glass is the reason that her etched signature is not on these because there was nowhere to put it and the paper label with her name is often removed. So this actually is a good piece. And then this piece here looks like Brad Keeler from California to me from the 50s. Let's take a look and see if it is. Oh, yes, there it is. Brad Keeler written right on there. That is a cute little tomato piece. It'd be better if it was a lobster, but I'd take a tomato. So let's see what it costs. And then we get this Keebler plate here. I'm looking to see who made this because McCoy and Francoma both made for Keebler. And this looks like it might be a late McCoy piece, but actually it looks more like stoneware. So I'm a little stumped. I don't think it's either McCoy or Francoma. Not sure who did that one. And then also Fab 50s kitchenware. And people love this 50s kitchenware. This is 25 for the set. It's not a bad price for a collector. It's a good price. The condition's pretty good. It's a cute pattern. Not the most exciting pattern ever, but really not a bad set for the price. And look at this. It is a toothbrush holder. It would have mounted to the wall. You'd have to make a new mounting for it, but this is old. This is when lavender was a popular bathroom fixture color, which was in the 20s and then again in the 50s. But I think this is a 20s or 30s era. So we'll see what they want for that. Okay. <laughs> we're all talking about each other. <laughs> yes, it's great. So um, we're taking pictures of each other, but this is downtown Centralia and it is an old railroad town and it is now one of the top 10 antique destinations in the United States according to USA Today. It is full of antiques and specialty stores and we're just going to give you a brief taste of that and Stephanie and her sons are going to go uh, look around and I am going to go talk to a guy about his signed Babe Ruth photo and so I will come back to you from Centralia sometime and show you a lot more because there's so much here. So this is just scratching the surface, but I wanted to give you a quick introduction at the end of this video to whet your appetite. I've had such a good time with Stephanie and her kids today. They were just really fun to go thrifting with and we did have thrifting adventures. So check out her channel and I'll be back to you on my channel in the very near future. I'm George the Antique Nomad on Periscope, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and bye-bye for now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now.